nine. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Sarah. Let's thank our kids one more time. We love our kids here at Light and Life. Such an incredible uh, part of our ministry to our little ones. Uh, we believe that uh, they are the most important part of this church. If you're uh, following along, we're in Romans chapter nine today. So if you have your Bibles, open them up, turn them on. We're gonna be in Romans chapter nine. And I've entitled uh, this message, God's Plan. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit uh, coming out of Romans chapter eight, where Paul is reminding us many truths about the grace and mercy of Jesus towards us, towards people that have become people of God. Now, Paul is gonna turn his attention in Romans chapter nine, then 10 and 11 to the Jewish people as they understand a God of promise, but also their necessity to make a choice to choose this God that has chosen them. So if you have your Bibles, open them up, and we're gonna be in Romans chapter nine today. We're gonna go through the entire chapter, so uh, take some time just to walk with me as we're guided through uh, these incredible verses today. Now, I wanna say this as we uh, open up into Romans. Uh, this is the big idea today. God is love. He's in control, and your ability to choose him has always been his plan. I want you to take a moment, look at this big idea, because this is going to shape the rest of this chapter for you. This chapter in the Bible is used to try to develop many theological points and paradigms and often misses the intention of both the original audience and the believer today. So today I want you to be aware that God is love, he's in control, and your ability to choose him has always been a part of God's plan. If you stick around here at Light and Life at all, you're gonna hear a little bit about the Wesleyan tradition. And here in the Wesleyan tradition, we believe deeply in the idea of free will, that God allows people to choose or reject him but I also wanna remind you that we equally hold the reality that though God allows us to choose, God is sovereign. Can I get an amen this morning? That means that God's will will be done. Whether you choose or reject God, God's will will be done. We know that Jesus is reconciling all things to him and that he is sovereign. So we have this ability to choose and yet God knows everything. Today in Romans chapter nine, we're gonna walk through this balance in scripture. And I wanna say that here at Light and Life, we believe theological truths in light of these chapters, not despite these chapters. Here at Light and Life, you're gonna get taught the entire word of God. Joel and I have the desire to teach through every single book in the Bible in five years. This summer, you're gonna hear uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We're going through Romans. We've done 1 Corinthians, Ecclesiastes. We've done Proverbs. And you are gonna continue to hear all of the word because the word says about itself that it is all useful. Can I get an amen today? So here's what I wanna talk about this morning. My main points are gonna be centered around this idea, knowing that God is love and he's in control and you have the ability to choose him and that has always been his plan, then we're gonna focus around the idea that the chosen must make a choice. Look at your neighbor and say, I am chosen, but I need to make a choice. So today we're gonna talk about that. Let's walk through verses one through five together. Paul is gonna give the idea that he wishes he could trade places with his people. He says this, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off for Christ for the sake of my people. Those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants and receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah. Now, comma, the Messiah, not the people of Israel, the Messiah 
who is God over all forever praised. Amen. Do you believe that today, church? See, Paul's saying this, I will take this truth to the grave. Jesus is the Messiah, and he's telling his people, you missed him. You missed him. He was right in front of you. All signs were pointing to him. The patriarchs, from the very beginning, the promises that you've been given, the truth you were revealed about God, you should have, if anybody, seen and known Jesus, and I will take it to the grave that I am not lying about my experience with Christ. What we must understand is that these chapters aren't written out of anger, but they're written out of a heartbreak for a people that are now blind to what Paul can see. Do you remember Paul's story? We first meet Paul in the end of Acts chapter seven. He's holding the coats of the men that are responsible for helping to incite the martyring or the murdering of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And then in Acts chapter nine, Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus, knocks him off his horse, blinds him, and then sends a believer named Ananias to him to preach to him that he might see that Jesus is the Messiah. He's healed both of his physical and his spiritual blindness. And from that point, he is baptized and able to see Jesus for who he really is. See, that Paul with that kind of experience is mourning the fact that his people who were set apart by God have missed God standing in front of them. Have you ever heard phrases like, I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God? Or when we were kids, we would say it like this, cross my heart, hope to die. And if you were me, poke a needle in my eye. See, these come from the idea that you are being fully honest before God that what you are saying is true. And Paul is saying this, what I have said is true and I will take whatever comes my way understanding that I am claiming that Jesus is God. Now, there are many people today that would say Jesus never claimed to be God and his followers never claimed that he was God. Let me tell you right here in these scriptures, we see Paul say he said he was God, he is God, and I say that he's God. Don't fall for the lies of the enemy that would try to tell you that Jesus was just a good teacher or just a good human being. No, actually, if Jesus claimed to be God, he cannot be good because he was lying. Today, Paul is saying he is God, give him your attention. And out of that truth, Paul wishes he could trade places with his people, that he could give his life for theirs. Think about the people in your life that don't know Jesus. Aren't there times where you wish, God, if I could just trade places, if they could just see the truth, if they only knew who you really are, God. This is Paul crying out saying, God, why can't they see what I now see? You've taken the blinders off of me, God. Could you make them see you as Lord and Savior? It's the same heart that Moses had for his people in Exodus 32. And it's the heart that Jesus has for every single person. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. See, Paul wishes that no one would choose to be separated from the love of God through Christ Jesus. He says, for who is God over all and forever praised, amen. What we learn from these scriptures is that we should have the desire of Paul. We should desire that no one that is part of our family or around us or in our cities or from our ethnicity, no matter where we find ourselves, we should desire that nobody would be separated from the love of God. Do you believe that this morning? But here's the reality. God uses our failure for his will to be done. Think about the times that you failed, but God was still working through you. Verses six through 13 say this, is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children. Listen to this. But it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. 
For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, listen, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Listen to me in this. I want to tell you this morning that we must understand Scripture in light of the rest of Scripture. We need to be careful not to read that and go, okay, well, God is elected that he hates certain people and loves certain people. No, what he's reminding them is that God's will will be done through Israel even though they rejected Jesus. And I want to say this to you today. You could choose to follow or reject Jesus, but Jesus' will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, either in you and through you or despite you. See, God is both loving and he is sovereign. And your rejecting his love doesn't mean that he's not in control and he will still use you whether or not you reject him. Some of the Jewish people had received Jesus. And this is where we find that not all the people of Israel follow him, but some are awakened to the truth of faith. Here's what I wanna remind you. The people of God are not an ethnic group or a specific nation that's set up on earth. The people of God are the people that believe and put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord. Do you believe in the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the coming again of Jesus? This is what Paul is teaching. We are children of this promise. This is why he mentions a child that was going to be sacrificed. He says that Abraham, the father of faith, this argument that he's made for chapters, this son, this promised son, was going to be a sacrifice, but Jesus became the sacrifice. And by the Son and through faith, you are welcomed into the family of God. But he takes it even farther. He talks about Jacob and Esau. And they're not mentioned to prove that God has predestined people that he loves and that he hates or that God decides to send people to hell. You know how I know this? Because there is no scripture mentioning the older actually serving the younger. It never happened with Jacob and Esau, but it happens with us. Let me take it a little bit deeper. Do you understand that the analogy that Paul is giving here is that the older child represents the Jewish people? Now they have served the younger people by allowing us to see Jesus for who he really is. And they, through rejecting the cornerstone, have made salvation available to everyone. Can I get an amen this morning? See, Esau was the older brother and yet the younger brother ends up with the birthright. Can I say this? We have the rebirth right. We have been given the ability and the right to be reborn in Jesus Christ through his sacrifice. Paul is reminding them that your bloodline, your ethnicity doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Let's keep walking through this scripture, verses 14 through 21. See, what is we must understand is that God's mercy is not our right. Our right is to be called children of God, but his love is a gift for us. Let's talk about this, verse 14. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Let me read that again. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. That is the foundation of your salvation. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on who he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Somebody needs to remember that this morning. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? 
What does the potter have the right to make, or does the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Here's what Paul is teaching us. Walk with me in this. He's teaching the difference between certainty and necessity. God is certain about your future. He doesn't need you to decide your future. He needs you to choose him. Let me walk in this. Pharaoh is actually a great example of God's sovereignty and the free will of man. What you find in this is you find that Pharaoh, multiple times, Exodus 7, 13, Exodus 7, 22, Exodus 8, 15, Exodus 8, 19, Exodus 8, 32, Exodus 9, 7, and Exodus 9, 34 actually say that not only did God harden his heart, but Pharaoh hardened his own heart. What do I mean by that? See, the main point is this. God is in charge of everything. He doesn't remove your free will, but he does direct your heart and actions to fulfill his eternal purposes. They were established before the foundation of the world. This is how God is sovereign. He says, you choose, but my will will be done. If, if God didn't give Pharaoh free will, then why does Moses keep coming to him asking Pharaoh to let his people go? If God has already decided that Pharaoh's not gonna do it and he's not giving him an opportunity to turn away from his hardness and his wickedness that lives in his heart, then what's the point of the story? No, rather Moses would have said, no, I know you're already gonna reject God, so here's what's gonna happen. God's gonna kill your son, it's gonna be a lot of drama and we're gonna leave, bye. But consistently, what happens? God sends Moses to knock at the door of Pharaoh's heart, reminding him, you are deciding that your will is going to be done, but hear me, whatever you do, your will will not be done, God's will will be done. God's mercy is this, that though he knows everything, though he foresees all situations, he allows you to choose or reject his will. But your choice doesn't mean that God doesn't get what he needs done. God will use somebody else in some other way and his will will still be accomplished. What God is saying is this, I don't want to work outside of you. I want to work in you and through you. Family, today, I want to remind you that God gives you the freedom to love him back. God gives you the freedom to choose a life with him, to be part of his will, to be part of what he's doing. And there will be many people that reject him. And no matter how many people reject him, it will not take away from his glory. It will not take away from his power. And God will still do everything he said he will do. But here's what we have to understand. We have to understand mercy. See, many of us compare mercy, but, but mercy defined is not getting what we deserve. And you know what we deserve? Death and destruction. None of us deserves the mercy of God, so who are we to compare it between each other? Who are we to look at somebody else and go, God, why do they have more mercy than I have? You don't even deserve it in the first place. Jesus actually has a whole parable of this. You remember Matthew 20? There's a landowner and he invites workers into the vineyard and the workers get upset because they've been working longer than other people that come into the vineyard and the people that have been working less get paid just as much and they're like, hey, come on now. I've been working hard all day and they're getting as much as I get. Here's the reality is that everything that God does for you, you could do nothing back. It's mercy, it's grace, it's freely given. Stop looking at what other people are getting and be grateful that God loves you and he's for you and he's not against you. This is what Jesus is teaching us. He's reminding us not to weigh our mercy with the mercy God shows to other people. I'll tell you, family, we are in a dangerous place when we regard God's mercy as our birthright. No, 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 no. No, it's your rebirthright. 
It's something that's given when you surrender. It's something that's given when you remember that it is not deserved, it is not earned, and it is only given because of God's love. This is why Jesus reminds us that the last will be first and the first will be last at the end of that story. Stop worrying about who's in front of you or behind you and just be grateful that God put you in line for eternity. Don't weigh your mercy against other people. Don't measure or compare something that you never earned or deserved in the first place. The whole point of this book of Romans is that you could not work for your salvation. Yet then we try to decide, well, oh, God must have thought ahead of time that he liked them better than he liked me. No, the reality is this, all are welcome at the foot of the cross. Slave or free, Greek or Jew, male or female, and God's will will be done. Do you believe that today? But you know, I hear a lot of people ask, well, if that's true, then how could a loving God? You ever heard that phrase before? You ever heard that? How could a loving God? How could a loving God allow war? How could a loving God allow this to happen to me? How could a loving God? See, what happens is because we think we earned mercy, now we think that we get to define how God loves us. Can can I remind you that that you don't get to define something that you didn't earn. That you don't get to define something that you can't do in perfection and God gives you in perfection. Let's talk about it, verses 22 through 29. What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the object of his wrath prepared for destruction? Now I wanna stop here for a second. God don't need to prepare you for destruction. You prepare yourself for destruction. Let's be honest. Many of us put, because God prepared us for destruction. No, you prepare yourself for destruction when you wake up and stub your toe in the morning or when you get a flat tire on the freeway or somebody cuts you off, right? We prepare ourselves. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom also he called, not only from the Jews, but from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of Israelites will be like the sand in the sea, listen to this, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah previously said, unless the Lord Almighty has left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been left like Gomorrah. Let me help you understand. Paul is using four prophecies to remind the Jewish people that though they were the chosen people of God, they need to again choose Jesus. He's gonna use Hosea 2, 23, Hosea 1, 10, Isaiah 10, 22, and 23. You can look to the Septuagint, Isaiah 1, 9. And then he's gonna mention Sodom and Gomorrah. Why Sodom and Gomorrah? What is he talking about in here? Well, there's an important connection here because he's saying this, Sodom and Gomorrah that was leveled and destroyed and fire and brimstone were laid and nothing escaped but the ones that God called out. He's saying, Jesus is your escape from hell. He's reminding you that is your only way to escape. And if you don't follow Jesus out, you will end up destroyed and overcome as a result of your sin. Here's what Paul is reminding them and us today. Jesus is your only rescue. Family, your money is not your rescue. Your job is not your rescue. The works that you do in this life are not your rescue. Not even your family are your rescue. This is what he's been telling the Jewish people. Your grandma's faith cannot save you. Your parents' faith cannot save you. You must follow the way of Jesus and you follow him out of hell and into eternity. But here's what I want to remind you. God will not force anyone to choose him. This is the whole premise of free will. And so when people say, how could a loving God send people to hell? 
I want to remind you today, God doesn't send anyone to help people choose it. It was never God's design for people to even be in hell. And it breaks the heart of God when people reject him, people that are made in his image, and they make deliberate choices to be separated from God. Let me remind you that the scriptures teach that hell was not made for people. It was made for Satan who rebelled against God. And when you follow rebellion, you get what you want, separation from God. We learn this in Matthew 25, 41. Jesus says the everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Scripture also teaches us that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all would come to repentance. How do you reconcile scriptures like this with 2 Peter 3, 9? You understand that God is not pre-elected people, but God in his sovereignty has said, I will give you the choice to choose or reject me. Follow me or follow Satan. The choice is yours. And in the end, you will get what you want. You'll either get God or you'll get eternity without him. Family, this is the choice that every person must choose. And it is very important in this generation that we do not water down the gospel because the more this generation tries to tell people that there's not a hell and there's many ways to heaven, the more we allow people not to follow the escape path that is found in Jesus only. Some Bible teachers said it like this, the gates of hell are locked from the inside and if you end up in hell, you have to practically climb over Jesus to get there. So let me ask you, as we look at verses 30 through 33, will Jesus be what you build your life on or will he become what you stumble over? Verse 30, what then shall we say that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not obtained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion, a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him, listen to this family, will never be put to shame. That is the gospel. Jesus is there like a stone, and you either pick him up and build your life on him, or you ignore him and you stumble over him. See, to try to approach God through our works will cause us to stumble over Christ and eventually be lost. To approach God in faith in Christ results in righteousness and salvation. Luke 20, 17, Jesus looked directly at them and he said, then what is meant as the meaning of this which is written, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus is the only stone that is a sure foundation. He's the only thing that you can build your life on. But if you ignore him, you will stumble over him. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Let me read this to you for just a moment. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care for no one can lay any foundation, listen, other than the one that is already laid, which is what? Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver or costly stones or wood or hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive award. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though as one escaping through the flames. Listen, listen. Christ is either the one that you receive or you reject. A rock on which you believe and build your life and who will justify you and release you of your shame or he's a stone that is a stumbling block to the offenses of your sin and you will fall into your pride. Don't stumble over Christ by trusting in your good works to save you. Don't stumble over Christ by believing that is a religious system that gets you to God. All the world's religions teach you this, but trust in Christ alone, and you will not be ashamed of the judgment that is coming. This is why Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but 
through him. So I want to challenge you today. See, our shame was deserving the wrath of God, but that shame has been put to death and it has been rebirthed in mercy. We can build on this truth or we can stumble over it. Today, what you have to decide is what will you choose? Not what did you choose, but what will you choose? And because God has given you the ability to choose, let me say this, you have to keep on choosing. See, choosing is like a verb. It's like to run or to skip or to dance, you know, dance like David dance, like my kids dance, crazy, out of control, without any rhythm. But it's a verb. And it's meant to be done. It's, it's not just something that you did once at an altar call, but every day you wake up and you choose or reject Jesus. Every day an obstacle comes in front of you and you choose or reject Jesus. Every day somebody does something against you and you choose or reject Jesus when you say, I won't forgive them even though God has forgiven me. Family, I want to remind you that this stone is meant to be built with. And you don't build a house in one day. But over time, you build and you build and you build and you build. And you build a place that ends up being secure, comfortable, and can offer shelter in the midst of trial and tribulation. Let me say this. When you build your life on Jesus, when you choose him, you choose eternity. But we need to continue to choose him. So let me ask you, in what ways are you rejecting Jesus? Not, not oh, I chose Jesus in 1967 at an altar call experience when a worship song came on that nobody sings anymore. Not, I chose Jesus last year but how do you choose him right now? How do you choose him over your anger? How do you choose him over your resentment? How do you choose Jesus over the shame that plagues and defiles your very soul? Will you continue in each and every situation to choose Jesus? Don't, don't be like the Jewish people given history, given truth, given people that come before them, people that came to them, God showing up in situations and then missing Jesus when he's standing right in front of you. See, I gotta be honest. There are times in my life where it's hard to choose Jesus. I've chosen Jesus. I, I remember the Sunday. It was the first Sunday of January in 2008. Here at this church, I think I was sitting right where my brother's sitting right here. Came forward in an altar call and I gave my life to Jesus. That was the beginning of my choosing. That was not my only choice. Every day I have opportunities to build my life on Jesus or build my life on things that will lead me to destruction. You know, when I think of Sodom and Gomorrah and I think of this scripture, you know what I think of? I think of Lot's wife. I think of her wanting to look back. And, and I wonder why she would look back. I mean, could you imagine? God has given you a way out. He's rescued you. I'd have, been, I'd have been like, don't look back, just run. There were situations in the hood where we didn't look back, let alone fire and brimstone leveling an entire town. And yet this way of escape finds this woman looking back. And I, I think maybe she was looking back for the things that she still loved in her heart that weren't of God. And I wonder how many times we look back and we get stuck. And on the journey that we're meant to walk with Jesus, instead of choosing him, we choose to look back to the things we had before we were following him. God won't force you to follow him. God won't force you. You have to choose. The chosen people have to choose God. Can I remind you today, Jesus died for you, but he hasn't chosen for you. He's loving you daily in every moment with his mercy, and he's giving you the gift of grace. Choose it by faith.
Choose it by faith. Choose it by faith. Would you stand to your feet with me today? Bow your heads for a moment. Close your eyes. This scripture has been used to try to teach people so many things, and yet we find Paul reminding us that we must choose Jesus. That we must choose Jesus over our shame. That we must choose Jesus so that we could die to our sin. That we, that we must choose Jesus because our spiritual pedigree can't get us anywhere. That we must build our life upon the truth of Christ. Not ignoring him or being blind to him lest we stumble over it. I, I don't want to be like Paul. I don't want to think I'm following God and in the process be ignoring Jesus. Let me tell you today, if you ignore him, he will knock you off your high horse and he'll give you an opportunity to follow him. He'll come to your heart and heart and he'll knock and he'll say, come on, just let me in. Let me change you. You don't even know the wrath and destruction that's coming, family. I wanna take a moment and for everybody that's within the sound of my voice, whether you're online or you're in person, as you search your heart today, and you recognize these scriptures talking about the salvation, the justification, and the sanctification of the believers that follow Jesus, let me ask you, search deep within your soul, is there anything that you're choosing instead of Jesus? Is there anything that you keep looking back to that has you stuck? Is there anything that you keep going back to and and God is saying, let me destroy it. Let me get rid of it. Let me take you to a new place. Could be resentment, anger, fear, shame, worry. The list goes on and on. And only you know really what your struggle is. Only you know the ways that you need to fully and daily choose the living God. So I wanna ask you with every head bowed and every eye closed, is there anyone in here that, that can recognize an area in their life where they're not choosing Jesus and they wanna choose today to give that wholly and fully up to him? Would you just raise your hand with nobody looking around? See your hand and your hand and yours and yours and yours and yours. There's many, there's many. If you don't have your hand up, I would just encourage you, this is a time to begin to intercede and pray. As people of God, we recognize that we need to pray and intercede for one another. If you're online, I just wanna encourage you today, you could message in and, and ask one of our pastors, say, this is me, I'm struggling. I, I raised my hand and we would love to reach out to you, but for those of you that have your hands up now, and if you don't have your hands up, just begin to pray with me. God, we choose you. Jesus, we choose you. We recognize that you, oh God, have drawn us out. Lord God, that as we have chosen by faith to follow you and your grace, Lord God, we recognize that we are not strong, Lord God, that, that, that we are not able, but Lord, actually in our weakness, we are made strong by what? By receiving you. And we ask God that you would indwell us with the Holy Spirit. That we would recognize, Lord God, that we, we stand not on merit or pedigree, that, that, Lord God, our ethnic heritage cannot save us, Lord God. Growing up in the church cannot save us. Our grandmother's faith cannot save us. We must make a choice. And not a one-time choice, but keep choosing you, God. In everything that we do, oh God, may we choose you. Lord, when, when, when we cannot forgive, Lord, give us the strength to forgive because you have forgiven us. Lord God, when we're overcome with anger, bring a peace that surpasses understanding. Lord, may we remember that we are undeserving of your mercy and your grace. And God, may we never compare what you're doing in others, Lord God, but only in every day, wake up, be grateful and say, Lord, you have had mercy on me, God. So I surrender to you. So today for every hand that was raised, Lord God, we pray that people would know that you have already forgiven, you have already done, 
and you are begging for them to choose you today. So Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you that you are love, that you are sovereign, you're in control, and God, you have given us the ability today and forever to choose you. This has always been your plan, that we, oh God, would be reconciled to you. So Lord, in every way that we are unreconciled, every way that we are frozen, every way that we look back to sin, may you burn that away, Lord God, and may we be focused and directed only on you, Jesus. Today, oh God, receive glory and honor and praise. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all of God's people say, amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? Thank you for your boldness, church. Thank you for those of you that raised your hand and said, God, I'm choosing you. I wanna encourage you today. If you made that choice, come pray with somebody. We'd love to encourage you along this journey. We'd love to help you understand what it looks like to continue to walk in a life where you are choosing to be directed by God. I wanna bless you today. Would you stretch out your hands in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, he knit you together, loved you before time began, and though he will have his will be done, desires that your will would be to follow him. So he sent his only son to die in your place that you would be justified, that all your shame would be released, that you would know that you are called a child of God and he has given you the Holy Spirit so that you in every choice could keep choosing him, keep walking towards him, to walk away from the things that are not him and say, God, I choose you. May you go in that power. May you go in that authority. And may you remember that God loves you, he chose you, he's for you, not against you, and he wants to live in you and through you. This is God's plan. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. Bless you, church. Thank you for being with us today.